Next week, I'm starting a series, and I've titled it Holding Forth the Word of Christ. And the series, what it is about, it is about the kingdom of heaven, uh, being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, and living here on earth. And I'm hoping that this will help us as we begin to go into some hard and difficult times, uh, some troubling times, um, as we go into an election month. I'm hoping that this will in, encourage us, this series will encourage us of what God has called us to do and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So that's going to start next week. I'm calling that series Holding Forth the Word of Christ. But uh, I was hoping that this morning would kind of be like a foundational type of um, message for us to, to lead to that series, if you will. So if you could turn to uh, Philippians chapter 2, we're going to be in verses 12 to 16. Now, I remember as a kid, when my brother or my cousins would do something to me, um, would offend me in some type of a way, I would go and tell my parents and or the adult who was in charge. Um, and this is actually a memory that is very, that my cousins, they always bring this up when we gather. I have a cousin that's actually going to be here in two weeks, and so you can ask them about this. And they remember a lot of things about me, but one thing they remember is that Timmy used to tell a lot. I used to snitch on them a lot, if you will. And I wouldn't just tell on them. Like, I would, I would make sure I had evidence. I would, you know, get witnesses. <laughs> and they would do something, and I was like, ooh, you're going to get it now. And I would, I would make sure I had all my evidence before I went to my parents or who was the adult in charge to get them in trouble. But... Often what would happen, and it would bother me, is that my parents or the adult would ask what I call now a God question. And they would ask, well, not all the time, but sometimes they would ask, what did you do? And I'd be like, it doesn't matter what I did. They offended against me. Do something about them. I need justice. And they'd be like, no, you probably did something to provoke them. That question, what did you do? Uh, the reason I call it a God question is because in the word of God, in 1 Peter 4, 7, Peter says this, for it is a time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what would be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? In other words, what God is saying is that the world will be judged, but we will also be judged. And even harder because we have the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. So God's judgment, if you will, begins with us. All through the scriptures, we see this, this uh, idea of, yes, um, the world is bad, uh, but what's going on with you? Are you looking at the log that is in your eye as well? So this morning, Paul, he acknowledges that we live in the world. We live in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. But he says this, among whom you shine as lights in the world. So today's message is titled Light for the Darkness. Christians are lights in the dark world, ignited by the word of life, Jesus Christ. Let's read uh, verse 12, going into verse 16. Therefore, my beloved, as you have, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Verse 16 holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the light of the world. And Father, you have given us Jesus to light our path, to, uh, to take us out of the kingdom of darkness and uh, to transfer us, us into the kingdom of the sun. Father, we thank you that um, you have not left us to figure it out on our own. You have given us a, a full play of your desire, um, your plans from the beginning of eternity past, um, that you would have a people for your own. 
that you would have a people who would be conformed to the image of Christ. Um, Father, help us um, as we consider this wicked world that we live in, that you would soften our hearts, that we would desire for many people to know about the other kingdom that they can be a part of, the kingdom of heaven. Father, help us to, to desire that for others, but also for our own selves. Help us to walk in obedience and to be a members of that community ourselves, to bring forth Christ as the hope uh, of the world and not ourselves or other psychologies or whatever it may be. So, Father, I pray you would really touch our hearts and help us to see us in this message today in our own personal lives where we as your children um, can show Christ more uh, in our life, but also to others. Let's call this in Jesus name. Amen. So here's the background. The Apostle Paul, he started the church in Philippi. He uh, started this young church in a hostile environment for Christians, and they are facing some severe persecution. And so Paul writes this letter to encourage the church to cling to Jesus, who is their joy. He also writes the church, this, this letter to the church uh, for them to uh, be on fire for unity and to uh, imitate Christ, as Paul says, uh, have the mind of Christ in their own personal lives. When we get to chapter two in Philippians, Paul is, and we've preached through the entire book of Philippians, as you may remember. But if you remember in chapter two, Paul, he's looking at the, hum the humility of Jesus and then he contrasts that with the children of God versus the children of the world. If I were to ask you today, what is wrong with the world today? I'm sure I would get many answers. Some would say guns, violence, um, unjust laws, racism, drugs. The list could go on and on and on. And that same question was asked to this uh, Christian thinker, if you will, G.K. Uh, Chester Chesterton. He wrote a brief letter to this newspaper that asked him the question, what's wrong with the world? And here is what he responded with. It says, dear sirs, what's wrong with the world? I am. Sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. What's wrong with the world? Well, people, that's what's wrong with the world. There are many problems in the world, but they are symptoms of something else. They are symptoms of the real problem, which are people who are created in the image of God, who have sin natures. This is the problem. I've told you many times before, and, and we've heard this joke before, I've said it here before, that I've, I've been to many protests and, and, and seen protests, and I've never been to a protest where a person was holding up a sign that said, I am the problem. Have you? It's always someone else. Someone else is the problem. And instead of acknowledging God and being thankful towards God, that's Romans 1. Human beings, what they do, what we do is we cling, before Christ, we cling to darkness. Jesus said this in John 3, 19. He says, and this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That's what the disease of sin does to us. And I don't know if you've ever thought of sin as a disease, but that is what it is. It turns us from the light of Christ to desiring and, and seeing hope in our flesh and, and in wickedness. We turn from the light of God. So what's the cure? Well, the cure is the light of Jesus. The Bible presents Jesus as the light of the world. And what we know about light is that it always, always defeats darkness. Darkness cannot hide from light. Paul says in our text, as children of God living in a crooked and perverse world, what we need to do is we need to obey Jesus. And in that, we are going to, to, to shine as lights to those who are in darkness. And as my series that I'm going to do next week will show, we're starting to get away from that as Christians. Um, many Christians have stopped fighting with the light of Jesus and have picked up the light of legislation or politics or the light of psychology or the light of theories. Remember in 20, uh, what was it? 2020 when CRT entered our churches. Remember that? How dangerous that was? Uh, how churches are still recovering from that? Or even violence or separation is, is ways that Christians are starting to fight. But how are we to fight in this wicked world? How are we to vote? How are we to live as Christians? 
Well, we're going to discuss that in this series next week. But Paul gives us these crucial foundational truths uh, to answer those questions. So Paul, like God, starts with the house of God and not, bless you, and not the world. Paul is saying, here is what you need to do or here is where you need to start. The, number one, if you're taking notes, real obedience from the heart. Look at verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What Paul notes here is that the Philippians, they faithfully followed his teachings, whether he was there or not. So Paul is bragging on them, saying that their obedience is not about impressing him or impressing the other apostles. And I can say, I, I know Christians who are like that. Um, maybe, you know, like the kid who is now an adult or they live away from their parents. When their parents come to, side, come to town, they decide, well, let's go to church. Let's go to church on Sunday. Mom's in town. Dad's in town. Let's go to, let's go to church on Sunday. Or even ourselves. When we try to impress people with our Christianity. And what I want you to know is that I hope if you're a Christian, I hope your Christianity is not uh, uh, based on what a family member thinks. I hope that your Christianity is not uh, based on what your pastor thinks. I hope you're not trying to impress me. Your, your hope is in Christ. That is who you need to worry about. I hope he is the one that gets you up on Sunday morning. Not my text saying, hey, where are you at? <laughs> right? And he is the one that keeps you from indulging sin. I hope it's not, I don't want to indulge in this sin to, to, uh, to hurt my, my, my mother or my father or my brother or sister, which sin does hurt other people. It never, sin is never just about you. You think it's you doing a sin and it's only going to affect you. It always affects others. But I hope that like David, when David sinned with Bathsheba, he said, I have sinned against you, God, first and foremost. You see what I'm saying? I hope that uh, he matters more than you than anyone else. And Jesus even says this. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 27 to 28, he says, what I tell you in the dark, you say in the light and what you hear whispered, you proclaim on the housetops and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both your soul and body in hell. We are to have what some people call an audience of one, and that one is Jesus Christ. We should care what he thinks about and work to gain his approval. He is the one, and here's the word, he is the one that we should fear. Look at verse 12. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now that phrase, work out there, is the idea of this uh, ongoing obedience for those who are already saved. And that's really important to say, because there are many false teachers uh, and others who have taken this verse to mean that we must continue to work righteousness uh, to gain salvation. And that's not what this text is saying, especially since Paul, he's already made it clear in Philippians chapter one, verse six, that God has begun a work in us and he's going to finish it. So God is doing the work. And then in the next verse, verse 13, to clarify it even more, he says, God is working in us both to will and to work. Um, it is God's work. We, we have gained salvation. The work that we needed is the work of Christ on the cross. So we are not working out our salvation uh, to, to or the good works that we do. We do not do them to gain Christ or his love. We do good works because Christ has loved us. We already have that love. And what helps us to do these good works is the fear of God. You know, you can ask yourself, do you want to be godly? And I believe many of us do, many Christians, we, we do want to be godly. Well, what is godlessness, if you will? Well, that's the opposite of being like God. That's the opposite, opposite of godliness. There is a lack of the fear of God when a person is ungodly. Just think about that. The sins that people indulge themselves in. Well, what they're really saying is that I do not respect that there is a higher authority. I do not respect that there is a God. That doesn't change when Christians indulge in sin. There's also a lack of the fear of God. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and fools despise wisdom 
and instruction. The one walking in the light, walking in obedience is powered by the fear of God. And I want you to notice also Paul, he adds the word trembling in there. And I believe that's because Paul knew there would be Christians who would be deceived by Satan who think that Christians shouldn't fear God. Whenever this comes up, a Christian, and I will say an immature Christian, jumps out of nowhere and says, hey, God doesn't want us to fear him. He wants us just to love him and he loves us. There should be no fear in this rever revelation and in, I, in this relationship. And I believe Paul says, hey, hey, there's fear and trembling. God is love, but he's also a mighty king. He's also a mighty warrior. We honor presidents. We honor people. We honor parents who have meant much to us in our life. But we treat God like he's our homeboy. That, that's unacceptable. There should be a reverence for God. Some Christians fear their parents more than God. Their whole relationship with God is based on someone else's relationship with God. So Christian, if you're struggling with godliness, well, there may be a lack of the fear of God in your life. And if we're going to judge the world for their ungodliness, well, we have to judge ourselves first and look at our own selves. The next thing, verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. So what Paul is saying is that Christians are to be content. In fact, in scripture, there's a, there seems to be this image of a Christian. He's happy. He or she is happy with what they have. And it's not a lot or maybe a lot, but they're happy with what they have and they live quiet lives. You see, contentment, it cannot be achieved by increasing your possessions because what we know is that nothing will ever be enough. Most of our complaining is really us saying, God, I'm, I'm unhappy with your decisions. I'm unhappy with your planning. I'm unhappy with your wisdom. Um, I could have, you know, I could have done better with my life than you, God. Why are we to be content is a question that we should ask ourselves. And the answer is this. We should be content as Christians because we have Jesus. We have the greatest reward there is to achieve. There is to receive. We have the greatest uh, reward that will actually last for eternity. We have Jesus Christ who tells us that he's going to outlast money, outlast uh, uh, people that you depend on. He's going to outlast everything. And he promises never to forsake us. Hebrews chapter 13, verse five says this. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Get this. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And for us as Christians, we know those are the greatest words that we can ever hear. We should also be content because often when we witness the people, what we're saying is that what we should be saying to them is that there is a better kingdom that you can be a part of. But when people see us, often we're complaining just as much as they are. And I often have to ask myself or ask others, what are you inviting people into when you give them the gospel? If you give them the gospel, and you say, come to Jesus, come into this new kingdom where there's righteousness and holiness. And then at the same time, you, you just don't even know how to smile. <laughs> you don't just, you don't even know how to just consider uh, anything that's good. Everything is a problem. Everything, there's, there's something going on. What are you drawing people into? There's also, Paul says here, disputing. Complaining often leads to disputes. And we Christians, we, we fight a lot. We fight a lot about a lot of things, and I'm not saying all fighting is wrong. And I think the reason we have so many cults and false teachers is, is because some Christians did not want to challenge others. There's this misunderstanding of love. And I try to tell people and try to tell my kids and others, God is love. So what God considers love is love. And in God's love, we see that God challenges false teachings. This is what Jesus did, and that is love. So sometimes we, we do need to stand up and we do need to fight. But a lot of the disputes among Christians have nothing to do with the Bible, nothing to do with the kingdom of God, uh, more to do with just traditions and things like that. And it makes the kingdom of God look like the kingdom of the world. That's why Paul speaks so much about unity, because in the world there's disunity. 
So when we're calling people to Christ and to the kingdom of heaven, what do we offer? Uh, one of the things is unity. And that's what Paul is saying. We are a nation that's in the midst of another nation. And so we have to shine in different ways to show people uh, that this nation is different than anything they've ever known. And is better than anything that they're ever going to experience. And the third thing that we see is in verse 16. I love this. Um, I'm not Pentecostal, but this, also, this almost caused me to run around in my house and, and some stuff. Um, I was just amazed at this and how I had missed this the first time I, I preached this as well. Um, I didn't think I preached it wrong the last time, but um, there's more than one meaning to this. And I preached only one, but this second one really got me going. So let me show you. Uh, Paul says in verse 16, holding fast to the word of life. So the Greek word for holding here, that's this Greek word for holding means to offer. And the word fast is actually mean, actually means forth. So put it together, offer forth. We offer forth the word of life. We are offering the word of life. And this is why I titled the series that I'm doing next week, uh, holding forth the word of of Christ. What we are offering to answer the question, what's wrong in the world, is often the wrong things. We often offer rules, regulation, medication, you, you, you name the list. But what we are to offer forth to the world is Jesus Christ and his word. Isn't that wonderful? I, I've been actually looking for that for a long time since actually 2020 when I was going up against so many uh, friends who were saying, oh, Tim, you need to CRT is a good thing and all this stuff like that. And I'm just like, I know in my heart, Jesus is enough. I just need a verse that says that so I can just shut the mouths of these people. And it was here the whole time. We need to offer the word of life, which is Jesus Christ. The political talk that should be in our mouth should be kingdom talk. The talk of a better king, the talk of a cure for sin, a talk of hope. And I'm sorry, I, I really question. I want to say this in a nice way. I haven't I haven't had I've only had like four hours of sleep. I'm sorry if I say something crazy. Um, my political correctness right now is my meter is at zero. Um, I, I do question the maturity, the maturity of a lot of Christians around me. Um, I don't know if the gospel has really, the gospel hope has really gripped their hearts. Um, and here's what I mean, because they say things like this election will decide the fate of America. And what I want to say is that two evil candidates will not move Jesus off of his throne. Two evil candidates will not disrupt his plans that he made in eternity past. Do, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? That the Alpha and Omega uh, was not shocked when Biden became president or Obama or Trump or whatever it will be. That his will will be done. What he desires for us to do is to offer forth his son as the answer to the world's questions. To the offer to the world the answer to the life's questions. To the biggest problem that we have uh, is sin. I tell people all the time, you know, there's a racism problem. We'll save them. Watch it go away. Watch them go away. It, it happened to me. I had racism in me, right? What changed me? The gospel. The gospel coming into my heart and changing and showing me that who God is and how he has no partiality. It works. And that's the thing that just bothers me is that we feel like it doesn't work anymore, but it still works. And this is another thing. Don't get what you see on TV. There's a big world out there. The, the gospel is still spreading. People are still being saved. God is still working. Maybe if it's not in your town, we think about Belmont here. This is a hard place to reach, very hard place to reach. And yet people are being saved. We see new faces walking here all the time, right? God is still doing his work. God is going to do what he's going to do. But we have to offer forth something that's real, and that's Jesus Christ. So how should we live? Well, look at verse 15. Blameless and innocent. 
children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Paul also said something like this to Timothy. He said, keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching. First Timothy 4.16, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. And what Paul is saying to, and to the church in Philippi and also to Timothy, um, he's telling us that, yeah, we live in the midst of a crooked generation, but in a way, God somehow makes us stand out at the right time where there's our jobs, where there's our homes, our family members. Uh, he, he uses us as ambassadors for him to answer these questions. So we must be obedient and we must be content and we must not be arguing with each other. We must uh, get these things right about ourselves before we move forward uh, and the other things and calling other people to what they should do. And I want to say something else. In this text, we see Paul's pastoral heart. Now, I know we only went to verse, well, it's in verse 16, and I'm only doing the first part of it, holding fast to the word of life. But Paul says this, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. And what Paul is saying right here is I, he does not want them to fall to the sins of the world and destroy the good work that he invested in them. And this is a, a pastoral concern from Paul. I want to read this quote. This concern is not about personal pride, but rather about investing his life, speaking about Paul, into people who were productive in serving the Lord. That, that's a pastor's heart. And that's my heart for open door. I, I sit and I think and I pray for you. I pray that you would be productive in serving the Lord. And I, I, I do it a lot earnestly. And, and I often get discouraged. Uh, but the discouragement doesn't stop me from praying for you. What it does is it encourages me to, to pray even more, uh, to, to pick up the phone and maybe have some hard conversations with some of you. Because I, I, I care for you, I, I love you, and I also know that judgment starts at the household of God. Where God is concerned about our lives as witnesses in this community. This is just Paul's pastoral heart, and this is the heart that I desire and I have for you as well. This entire world is disobedient to God and it's discontent with life. Let that not be the people of God. Let us not be disobedient to God. Let us not be discontent with God. It's, it's, we live in a world where, you know, we said this a couple of weeks ago, you can't even be a rebel anymore, Right? Because everyone's a rebel. So if everyone's a rebel, no one's a rebel. Being a child of God now is the new rebel against this current demonic principalities that we actually live under. But when we as Christians try to live like the world, we're saying that there's something that we see in this world that's worthy. I don't know about you. I don't. I see a fallen world. I see a world of sin. I see a world that Jesus entered into and died so that we could be saved, so that we could be a part of the new kingdom that he is going to bring. That, that is what I see. And that is what we really should posture our hearts as we consider the holidays are coming up. That's another reason why I wanted to do the series. We're going to be around the table with our families and friends. I want you to be able to have real serious conversations with your family and friends and enter into some of these hard questions that are going to be coming up during this election year. I want you to be able to not just win debate, but to bring someone to the kingdom. I heard a Christian say something as recently, and I'll close with this. Um, it was a Christian that just won the Dove Awards, uh, which I don't watch, and well, whatever. But um, he said uh, something that just got back to me, whatever I was watching. He said, yeah, my album went gold, but I'm starting to think like if no one gets saved, I failed. That's a total different perspective that I've never heard from a Christian artist. I've thought this before, that God has given you this platform and somehow, you know, Christian artists, they make these songs all about themselves. But if you've made an album where the gospel is clear and people can hear it, right? And people are maybe are writing it and letting you know, hey, this led me to Christ. That, that should be the standard, not if we made people dance, right? So take that idea and put that into what we're talking about tonight. Uh, the goal is not that we live these simple, quiet lives where we get out of this thing with no hurt and just comfort. <laughs> That's not the goal. The goal is that we offer forth Christ to friends and family. And by the grace of God, someone will come to be saved. Amen. Let's pray. Father.
I want to speak to those here t today who are here and we do not believe that, that is by chance that are here and they do not have a saving relationship with you. Um, first, Father, I thank you for this kingdom that you've given us, that you have not given us what we deserve. We deserve hell. We deserve separation from you because of the sin in our lives. And yet you are just God. But you are also a loving God, a righteous God, an all-wise God. You came up with a plan to save us so that you would have a people for your own possession. And that is through the blood, the torture, the murder of your son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, thank you for dying for our sins. Thank you for living that perfect life that we could not live and standing in our place and going on the cross for sins you did not even commit. Father, I, I, I pray for those here who do know you first, for those who of us who do know you, Father. Help us to be reminded of the hope that we have and not to have the media and everything that's going on um, make us forget of the victory that we've already won through your son. Help us to be, remember that Satan is a defeated foe, active, but he is a defeated foe. Father, help us to be bold, to stand up for righteousness, to speak out against injustices, to speak out against sin. Lord, may we never be those who are scared to say what is right. But Father, help us to understand the mission field in a way that we understand that you have called us to live as aliens here on this earth, um, in this dark world, to be light. Uh, give us soft hearts. Give us the spirit of Jesus, your Holy Spirit, Lord. Help us and fill us with your spirit that we would speak truth in love. But at the same time, we would stand fast, that we would have confidence in the armor of God that you have given us. Father, um, just help us as we have these conversations that are coming up. I know a lot of us have anxiety when we, during the holidays. Lord, help us to, uh, to speak truth and to trust that you would do with your word what you want to, to happen, Lord. Let us just be people who trust you and love you. But personally, let us not be hypocrites. Father, help us to see, evaluate our lives. That's the word, Lord. Help us to evaluate our lives, that we would not just point fingers at others and forget that you care that your house is pure and holy and righteous and walking in the spirit that you've given us. But Father, I also pray for those who are here who do not know you. Father, I hope they would understand and see that you love them. You love them so much that you died for them, that you sent your son to die for their sins, and that there is nothing in this world that is sufficient enough um, for them. In fact, this world is full of deception. This world, this world is deceiving them. And many people every day go to their graves, uh, spending their entire life placing their faith and their hope and their trust on people and persons and things, only to find everything to fail them. Because the only thing that is sufficient for human beings is you, Jesus. So Father, I, I pray for those here who do not have a relationship with you, that you would remove the blinders that Satan has placed on their eyes and that they would see you, Jesus. Father, help them to see that you are the only hope, that all the things they desire, that the world is trying to work for this unity. There is no unity outside of Christ because we are sinful creatures. Father, I pray that you would open their eyes and they would see that all they have to do to enter this kingdom is not works. Christ has done all the work. All they have to do is place their faith in you, Jesus. Asking for your forgiveness, asking that you would be their savior, believing in their heart that you died and rose for our sins. Father, I pray for our church here in Belmont, Lord, that you would give us more opportunities to be a light. Um, I, we thank you for the, uh, the, the, the um, I can't remember what we called it, but the, the activity that we did this summer, uh, the movie night that we did this summer and all of the relationships that were built from that. And Father, we thank you just for that opportunity to see that what we can do. Father, give us other opportunities to uh, be a light in your community. Lord, help us not to grow weary in, in doing good, um, but strengthen us, Lord, to continue to work uh, for your glory until you return. Father, we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.